I'm an engineer automation, and uh, here today to talk about biometrics and some of the uh, the problems that are uh, inherent with biometrics that uh, a lot of us just may not think about, um, which is what had me coined the fantastic failure point of the future. Before we get started with with that, I, I found something very interesting in preparing for this uh, this talk, in that uh, biometrics has a very long history. Uh, it's been around for over 4,000 years. So it was used to, fingerprints were used to prevent forgery way in 2000 BC. Uh, they were used in, in uh, Assyria and where you put your thumb on a clay tablet, it's been used forever. Uh, 650 AD, it was already being used to solve crimes. Mid 1800s, it was used for just identification for individuals. In the 60s, we got voice recognition in the 80s, we got retina and iris scan. In the 2000s, we got facial recognition. Facial recognition was actually more used for identifying individuals in crowds as opposed to uh, any kind of uh, authorization or any kind of uh, factor, biometric factor. And the thing that changed it all for most of us was 2013 when Apple introduced Touch ID. It was a highly distributed, easily available, very reliable biometric. And, and through these times, there hasn't been a lot of consideration as to some of the, the fallbacks of this. Uh, as far as, uh, there's been some on the military level how you, you deal with identity fraud and how you can uh, improve the uh, detection mechanisms to determine if that is someone's fingerprint, you know, facial recognition, is it just a picture, those types of things. Um, but all these things create a singular problem. And, and the specific problem that biometrics have is in being stolen. So Yahoo in 2014, they announced it last year, but in 2014 they had 500 million user records stolen. This crowd probably knows that better than most. In, this, in these user records were things that people used to verify an individual, right? Knowledge factors, these uh, security questions, date of birth. This was part of the records that were stolen. Half a billion. If there were biometric data in there, that'd be a serious problem. Fortunately, no biometric data. Anthem, last year. 78.8 million records, including some biometrics. A lot of history information. When you steal medical records, you get a lot of people's history, where they've lived, who their parents are, who they've had contact with. A lot of information that you can use for social engineering without having to actually, without having to do the social engineering part. The data is already there for you. On biometrics, the worst one so far, as far as as far as I can see, is the Office of Personal Management. Uh, if you, does anybody here have a security clearance? Is your security clearance more than two years old? Then if you submitted your fingerprint, it's possible that it's out there. And you probably have this wonderful stuff that says, we'll protect you against uh, um, someone stealing your identity. Uh, and that's what they've basically done so far. But the other problem is, is that as biometrics and multi-factor authentication become more and more the norm and they're going to be required, right? NIST has said the only way to stop these, these credential problems is you have to have multi-factor authentication, true multi-factor, which includes biometrics. If your information was in those files that was taken, then you're a risk from this point on. Um, and this particular breach is, is the one that we know about. And the reason that it's going to become such a target in the future is that biometrics are more valuable than passwords over time. So when you think about passwords and what passwords are worth, they have an immediate high value. Before the breach is discovered, they are worth a lot of money. And the reason that they're worth a lot of money is because until the breach is discovered and the users change their passwords, you have access to their accounts. The other thing that you have access to is every other account that that individual has that shares the same passwords. 60% of people on the planet use the same password for more than one thing. And most of them use their same passwords on uh, some social site as they do for their email. 
So if you go grab that, you can grab their email, you can grab their bank account, you've now owned that user, and you're able to do just terrible, terrible things. But once the, the breach is known, the value of that password goes down over time. Because individuals, most individuals will change their passwords. Today, when these breaches happen, you actually are told, and go change every other account that has that password. They didn't used to say that. But now they're saying that. But biometrics are very different. The value of a biometric increases over time. An unencrypted one has a value today, but there's not a whole lot of people using biometrics that you could actually use that to forge access. But over time, as it's required more and more, if you have someone's fingerprint, that fingerprint becomes more valuable. And those individuals that are at a certain level, when that was taken, let's say today, last year, and the next year or two, some of those individuals are going to become very high-profile individuals. Imagine if you got the uh, biometric fingerprint of, let's say, the head of the Harvard Law Review, right? 10, 15 years later, he's the president of the United States. So the biometric never changes. If you got their password, they would change their password. You do all these things. They can't change their fingerprint. You can't change your fingerprint. There are certain things you can do for your facial characteristics to change it, but the whole idea of a biometric is it belongs to an individual. It is unique to that individual, and it can't change. But even if you take a look at encrypted data, so the things that we do to protect data is that we encrypt it. But over the period of years, that fingerprint doesn't change. Your biometrics don't change. Encryption technology and computer technology changes. I would say 90% of the people in this conference and anyone who's a decent hacker could break into any brute force, any crypto from 1970. Right? I think that would be a real no-brainer you'd be able to bust hashes from 1970. I don't think that's going to become a problem. So if you steal the identity of a 30-year-old today or a 20-year-old, in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it becomes less and less expensive to actually utilize that data. It can sit around forever because it doesn't lose a shelf life, right? <laughs> it gets better with age, and it gets easier to crack and less expensive to crack. So that's a very, very scary thing. And what that means is that we have to protect biometrics better than passwords. Today, if, if you're a security professional, you're trying to buy yourself three days. Right? You're, you're putting in these cracking techniques that will protect the users of terrible passwords for three days. Because when you get a password list, you run against the top 100, the top 500, whatever that is. Some of your users are going to get pwned early. Some of them are going to get pwned late. Hopefully, most of the people that are using bad passwords don't get pwned before they find out that their password needs to be changed. It doesn't work for biometrics, right? You can't go change it. So there's a few things that you can do and you can think of. Most of us probably aren't writing biometric systems. Uh, if, if, we, if you are, you probably know about all of this. But you may be looking at, you may be told or have been uh, given the mandate that you have to implement multi-factor authentication. That must include biometrics, right? If you're in uh, banking, if you're in uh, medical, uh, if you're any, any sort of finance or any side of security, you're going to have to be doing multi-factor authentication. And there's things that you should really think about in protecting your users, protecting yourself. Your own biometrics are going to be in the system. So think about that. One of the things that you can do is you can create knowledge-based entropy versus uh, via what's called private biometrics. So there's been a way where when you do your encryption, you don't have blanket encryption, right? And the way that we don't create, uh, we can create entropy, right? You have initialization vector that's different across all of your encryption. One of the things that you can do and make that very quick and not have that stored anywhere so it's much harder to crack and requires brute force is you can do that via a pin that, that someone's going to enter in. Right, a knowledge factor that someone's going to enter that only the user that belongs to that biometric should know, and you can use that to encrypt that biometric so it makes it much more difficult to decrypt. But again, over time, encryption doesn't really mean much. So one thing that you can do is you can obfuscate the relationship between the biometric and the individual. Don't have a very easy to determine one-to-one -one account. So this is one way where you can use that, uh, that knowledge factor given to you by the user 
and you use that to create a hash, and that's how you identify which biometric to use for that user. You're going to be able to crack that biometric. That biometric is going to be able to be decrypted in 30 years, 40 years, maybe even 10 years, right? The way we're, the way we're moving towards quantum computing, we're all, we're all nervous about quantum. Uh, but if you can find a way to break that tie between the user and their biometric and make that much more difficult uh, to understand, that's going to give you an advantage. It's not going to solve everything, but it's going to give you an advantage. Because again, the biometric value is just going to raise over time. And because of that, there's something very important that you can do that is, I would say, it's not an easier thing to do. Um, it's much harder. But what you can do is you can decentralize biometric stores. And what that means is, is that you don't have a central repository, right? The reasons that passwords are so valuable is because you can go grab them all and you can run this top 100 passwords or top 500 passwords. You can try and see which accounts have these top 500 passwords. And you can hope that that individual has the same for the email. They might have the same thing for their bank account. You try and log in with their email and their password out of the top five banks. And you might find it there. But if you decentralize, then you're going to have to go after these, these decentralized stores. And that brings us back to this device. Mobile devices are reasonably secure. If I was going to try and steal a biometric from you, I would not probably get it from your phone. I'd find a way to get it from your finger. Right? I'd find a way to take a 3D image of your face before I try and crack your phone. But these devices are very good at holding secure information. They're very good at verifying fingerprints. They're very good that selfie cams today are over a megapixel. That's enough information, especially if you take multiple frames to get a good 3D image to get uh, re facial recognition. Uh, last year, Bank of America came out with this great selfie, right, the, the selfie off thing, uh, because they're using smartphones, because the technology is there. You know, I, I, feel uncomfortable with anything that I have to constantly sign in with, but I can't just use my, my thumbprint on my phone. It's become expected. Right? These devices have changed everything as far as biometrics is concerned. But what most of the services do today, with the exception of the actual fingerprint reader, is they'll take your picture and they'll send it off to a central service to go verify and validate. They'll listen to your voice. They'll send it to a central service to go verify and validate. What you can do is you can do this all on the device. If you create a good enough, uh, good enough way to link the device and understand that, yes, I have, I have a high level of confidence that this is the user for this device, I can trust the device can make those determinations as to whether or not this is the same person on their photo, that I can use the biometrics that are inherent in that device with a thumbprint reader. Uh, I can do certain things. Uh, some of them can even determine your pulse heart rate, all those types of things that can be used as biometrics today. We can leverage this device as a decentralized store that protects you and your users from being pwned by a massive grab like the OPM grab uh, that even people in this room here right, are, are vulnerable to. And as individuals, I think we need to ask for this, right? We should be in control of our own destiny, right? When you own your own data store for your biometrics, you're in control of your own destiny. Some people, some of us do that. Uh, they have the cards that'll do it as well, hold it there. There's a couple different ways you can do that outside of the smartphone. The smartphone puts everything in one place, right? Where you're not gonna have to transmit data across and make that susceptible to being grabbed. It all happens, it all verifies, it's all local. Any questions? There should be a lot. No questions. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is that you have very secure communication uh, and very good identification between the device, the linking process between the authorization system and the, and the device. You create 
basically bulletproof, rock solid communication there uh, with, a, with a good linking process to be able to understand that this is the correct user, possibly out of band, even do it visually, uh, like a lot of places where you set it up, you'll actually go to your administrator and they'll set it up there where you put in a code off of their screen. You can have a high confidence level that the communication is not being intercepted. You can have a high confidence level that this is the actual individual responding, or if not the individual responding, they've allowed someone to respond in their stead. Does that answer your question? Correct. And, and, and the reason that it gets happened on the peripheral is the data is stored on the peripheral. So it, it, the systems that are available today, a majority of them, it, there are a lot of different uh, systems that you do that with your thumb currently, right? I log into my bank with my thumbprint. That's just for my phone app. Now what you're gonna start to see coming is you're gonna start seeing the same thing of when you go log into uh, your bank on the website, it's gonna put an off request onto your phone, right? Yahoo, their big, uh, their big recovery from the 2014 is on 2016, they have passwordless login. They have no credentials. So the last time they told me to go change my password, I didn't have to because I don't have one. I have a mobile app that's installed on my, installed on my device that I can do that with. Once you start adding in uh, biometrics with that as well, which are available on the device, you get, a, you get even more secure passwordless, uh, set, there, where there's no central credentials whatsoever besides your identity. Yes, question. Because in the trust execution environment, that's not accessible by your Bluetooth. So devices have this trusted execution environment, which is where your, uh, your iPhone or your Samsung uh, or your Google phone, that's where they store the fingerprint. They're storing a trusted execution environment that's not available to other processes. Now they're starting to come out with, and it's, it's actually very expensive to do right now because it's, it's fantastically uh, trademarked and uh, a lot of legal stuff around there for licensing, but you can get phones with trust execution environments where your application can run in a trusted execution environment. And I, I don't, I'm not saying trust the phone. Don't just, don't just stick it in the secure store on the phone. Encrypt your data. Stick it in the right place. Use the right things that you're going to do on any single application that you have today. But if you do that right, and if you have a good enough bug bounty and good enough people that are trying to attack it, you can... You can defend against what I've seen so far, every one of those vectors. You know, I work for a company and that's what we do, and no one has been able to actually hack the fingerprint yet, even on, um, on any one of the devices that have the fingerprint. They haven't been able to do it, even with a, uh, a rooted phone. They've not been able to bypass that currently. I'm sure there's, there, there's the, someone, someone actually got uh, the bounty for the zero day, whatever that is, <laughs> for remote rooting of an Apple phone, but we haven't seen it. Uh, and we also, you know, if you test against security against rooted phones, you, you've got the advantage there of making sure that your stuff is going to be secure even if it's rooted. Right. Right, and, and phones come at different security levels, right? So you've got, right now you have the, the Google phone, right, that a president uses, and you have the BlackBerry that is completely secure, <laughs> right? On separate networks, completely unownable. Well, completely unownable, right? So you, you have highly secure phones, you have less secure phones, but as a user, you get to make that decision, as opposed to once everyone on the planet starts requiring biometrics, who are you gonna trust? Right? When I have to go to Facebook, am I going to trust them with my biometrics? Am I going to trust Google with my biometrics? Right? Who am I going to trust? Because it's, it's, everyone's going to require it. Right? Am I, going to, I, I use a small bank. 
I use a small bank because I like customer service. But do I trust that bank with biometrics? Probably not. Correct. It, requ it requires a good linking strategy, um, usually an out-of-band linking strategy uh, to some extent, but that's also going to depend on how you're going to do that. Um, usually when you have these biometric systems, you determine how you're going to do the linking between the biometric and the user. So that's one of the things you definitely have to be careful of, and there's a, a few different ways that you can do that as far as you know, determining the credentials of, of individuals. Now, it's going to be more difficult farther out. Um, once you start moving from your local enterprise out to, you know, Google um, for, what you, for accessing Google Apps, they're not going to come and come to your door <laughs> and watch you pair every time. Um, but there are a bit ways that you can do that uh, through uh, very, very high confidence um, systems that will allow you to use your identif identification, right? Your identification has markers in it um, that can be determined if that's a valid identification and whether it's actually your identification. So there's a few things you can do on that for remote stuff as well. Any more questions? Thanks. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be around. My flight's been delayed, so I'll be here a little later than I thought. Um, and uh, just coming out of the discussion, if you don't believe any things I've said, I'd love to hear what your, um, what your cons are to the whole system. Um, because I don't believe in arguing, I believe in discussing. And uh, I gave you my point of view, I'd love to hear yours. So thank you very much.